Hello, uh, I am James Butler and I'm here with the excellent Sarah Jaffe. Sarah, uh, among her many accomplishments, is author of Necessary Trouble, which is an excellent book, uh, host of an exciting podcast about uh, US labour, US uh, organising. But you've been here for uh, the passing of the Green New Deal missions. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're kind of very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, Just just like an hour ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what do you make of this, though? Because I know there has been movement in the States, yeah. especially from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, yeah. uh, young left right. uh, congressperson. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. What do you make of, uh, of, of, of that? Is there a difference between the kind of the, the approaches to Green New Deal here and there? I mean, I, there is a lot of difference just in terms of like, there's a party here that you can actually make motions through. Um, so that's a thing. It was funny, I was having one of those late night conference conversations that you have with somebody and was saying like the first time I heard the term Green New Deal was in 2008, right after the financial crisis and Obama is president and everybody's like, oh, what can we do? We can do a Green New Deal. And that would be, you know, again, a, a, a solution to massive economic crisis that would also have the you know benefit of, of fixing the climate crisis. We got the opposite of that. We got eight years of fracking um, and there has been just you know very very little movement and the Democratic Party leadership is really resistant to doing much of anything not just on the Green New Deal but like anything as far mm -hmm, as I can tell mm -hmm. right now. Um, asking them to like show up to work is a stretch. <laughs> And I'm opposed to work, but like, come on, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> um, so the other thing is that like, uh, you know, to move something like this, we don't have a party to move it uh -huh. through. It ends up in a presidential platform, but it then still has to get through Congress. Mm. So even if Bernie Sanders, who has a radical Green New Deal proposal, which like, don't ask me too many of the details because <laughs> not actually like the like climate reporter mostly, but like, even if he gets elected president, mm -hmm. right, which could happen, sure. Um, to actually get it through Congress, we need to also elect a couple hundred more Alexandria mm, ocasio Cortez's mm, mm. because it's not enough to just be like, Bernie can do this. Yeah. Like, there are things they can, the executive can do, but like, eh, it's kind of limited. So it's, it's complicated. We well, need more congressional I, candidates. I, I, think this is, I think this is something in common for the left in well, the yes. UK and the US, yeah. which is that- You need more better <laughs> candidates, we need yeah. better. We need better left representation. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, but obviously, I mean, there's, there's been kind of astonishing stuff yeah. going on in the US. Um, and it's something that maybe I think uh, a lot of our viewers don't know very much about, um, but will have heard on, on the grapevine. There's a big UAW strike coming, yeah, the, the, it's, the auto it's, workers it's against on, General Motors. Tell us, tell us about where it comes from, what, what the yeah. roots of this are. So it's, it's in, I, I'm actually shocked that they're on strike. Like nobody, <laughs> we didn't think this was going to happen. Um, it's been quite a while since the UAW's had a big strike. This mm. is one of mm. the biggest since, I don't know, decades. And year, earlier this year, I went to Lordstown where there's a very famous GM plant that has a history of radical worker activism, um, of really challenging the union leadership as well as the management of the factory. Mm. And it was closed down this year. It's one of several plants that GM sort of unallocated, which is a term that nobody had heard before. Like when I was talking to the union leadership at Lordstown, they were like, this is like a new one on us and we've been mm -hmm. in this union for you know decades. I talked to a guy who worked at Lordstown in the 70s during all the wildcat strikes. You know, They're like, what is unallocated? Mm -hmm. So what's happening in bargaining, among other things, is that GM is using these closed plants as sort of bargaining chips, um, saying we'll put some more manufacturing in these places. Yeah. Um, they're talking about putting like battery manufacture in Lordstown, which would be cool, right? Like mm -hmm. it could be like greener manufacturing, great. But the thing that they want out of the workforce really is they want to keep their two-tier structure that they won during the financial crisis and they want more temps. Mm -hmm. And the temps thing is really, really huge because um, I was actually telling a story on a TWT panel the other night. One of the things, if you look at the statistics in US manufacturing in like the 80s and 90s, is that there's definitely decline due to outsourcing, offshoring, we know that. There's definitely decline due to actual automation. And then there's also just decline of like, industrial jobs on the record because a lot of these companies are hiring them through mm. staffing agencies, mm. temp agencies, that because of a weird way the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates employment, they are calculated as service jobs, not industrial jobs. Right. So we could potentially have like seen as many industrial jobs lost 
not really lost at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just made temporary. So you've got workers on the assembly line in these factories who are employed by GM, members of the union, um, have benefits, have a profit sharing agreement where they could get a $10,000 check mm -hmm. of GM profits if the company's doing well. And then you have a guy next to them who's making, you know, I don't know, 10 bucks an hour right. and is can be laid off immediately, has no contract, and certainly doesn't get that profit sharing agreement. And the companies do this because they're easier to get yeah, rid of. So you can expand and contract your workforce very easily, and also they're cheaper. So although the temp agencies weirdly like cost them money, so it's yeah. still they're not as much cheaper as yeah. you would think. So this is this is an ongoing thing about manufacturing that like the ex expansion of this kind of, you know, contingent workforce in these unionized plants mm. and GM wants to keep it and that is what they are really, really fighting over here. They've mm. offered some things, um, but that's the sticking point. But it's, I mean, it, it's sort of amazing because I, I sort of saw some reporting on this stuff that was saying, organized labor is back. Uh, it's been away forever. I would love that. It's been I would love that. <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> but it is, so is this... Is this uh, there was a big... It's complicated yeah. over this strike, right? One is that like all of us were kind of like, wait, what? Like people like me who like <laughs> follow this crap, yeah. right? Who like spent, you know, a bunch of time hanging out around in a, you know, UAW office mm -hmm. fairly recently. Um, we're like, they're, they, what, they what now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so the question of like preparation and whatever is really... You know, Big. There's just a big question mm -hmm, mark mm -hmm. on how ready they are for this. Um, there's also been corruption charges at the very top levels of the UAW. Um, there are people getting arrested, you know. So some people are wondering, you know, if mm. they sort of shoved them out on, you know, decided to go on strike. They didn't have to shove the workers. Mm -hmm. The workers are pissed. <laughs> um, they certainly didn't shove anybody yeah, yeah, out yeah. on strike. And that's the thing. They're still out. Um, the workers are tired of this crap, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. They're tired of concessionary bargaining. They're tired of two-tier workforces. They're tired of this guy being a temp and this guy not. Um, and they're out on strike and they're ready to be out on strike. And like the labor movement being back in whatever sense is a very complicated question. There's certainly more strikes happening in the US than there were. And the other thing that's happening is that like there's a left, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. So the same thing, that happens here now when you get like momentum activists joining a picket line somewhere is happening with like DSA groups are going to join the picket line. Um, a friend of mine has been out in um, on the like night picket shift with mm -hmm. GM workers in um, Pennsylvania. So you get like there is sort of a culture around labor that's coming mm -hmm. back slowly. Um, it's not big enough by like orders of magnitude, yeah. not big enough obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it is a thing that is you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of it's 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 sort of amazing in some ways. I you know, I was reading some of the reporting around this stuff and around this kind of yes. It, I mean, as you say, it's often very sensationalistic. Yeah. There's some interesting numbers about the the number of young people joining yeah. trade unions, which is, yeah. which has been sort of it's been a problem at, you know across the globe mm -hmm. and certainly within yeah. uh, you know it, within the UK is that the, the yeah. union membership yeah. tends to be older, yeah. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, of course, that there's political support, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned, of course, that there is now a left in the U.S. There, there which, is a left. You know, We've got one. Um, you know, my, my European friends were astonished when you know Corbyn yeah. won exactly. in the Labour Party. Yeah. It's like Britain has a left, and I, I feel know. I feel like yes, this about exactly. the emergence of yeah. uh, democratic socialism yeah. in, in the U.S. Right. But but the, the, it does seem to me that there is there is sort of some awkwardness uh, about the relationship between Democratic Party and labor, yeah. organized labor. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and this is because it's very different, isn't it, from, mm -hmm. from the UK. And you have yes. you know, the Labour Party here, which is you know, institutionally linked to the trade unions, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, however oddly sometimes, yes. and however, well, certainly. You know, however difficult that sometimes is. It, it, there's obviously, the Democratic Party doesn't operate in that no, way. No, right? no. And it actually goes back to um, the 70s. Once again, everything bad goes back to like <laughs> 1972, right? Um, but in this particular case, the fight over sort of changing the way that the decisions were made within the Democratic Party, within the Democratic primaries. Um, this is the election that ended up with McGovern as mm -hmm. the Democratic candidate and then getting absolutely stomped by Richard Nixon. But what they did do was they took away the power of these institutional, you know, affiliates of some mm -hmm. sort, right? I don't, it's not a relationship like this one, but like 
decisions would be made in smoke-filled rooms by a bunch of mm -hmm. dudes, and most of them, you know, had various positions of power, and one of those positions of power was leading big unions, um, was being George Meany, was the mm -hmm. head of the AFL-CIO at the time. And so they, like, deliberately did that back then, in the middle of, you know, the unions were being reactionary on the war at that point in time, mm -hmm. rather than on climate policy at that time, you know. Um, and some of the people who then sort of come out of the McGovern space, like Gary Hart was mm -hmm. one of the people who was working, was like a young idealistic guy working for McGovern and then becomes one of these like third way Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. This, this, the roots of that kind of thing, that, that third way politics yeah. that sees unions as sometimes a useful piggy bank, mm -hmm. people to be pandered to, um, but not actually important constituents of the party and then you stop seeing unions as people who are like decision makers and you just start to see like the white working mm. class in that big old scare quote weird othering way that everybody talks about the white working class whether it's like Leeds mm -hmm. or Lordstown <laughs> and so that kind of relationship where essentially the candidates will take union money the unions will endorse the safe candidate like most of them endorsed Hillary Clinton mm -hmm, last time around mm -hmm. and that was this sort of absolutely dysfunctional, borderline abusive relationship that, yeah, that organized yeah, yeah, yeah. labor has had with the Democratic Party. The question then for me is the flip side of that. Because yeah. so the thing we heard uh, here was that Trump succeeded by appealing to people who would kind of habitually, or that you would think of as having been habitually, democratic voters uh, in sort yeah. of Rust Belt states, yeah. people, you know, who, who's, who's kind of communities had the, yeah. the bottom knocked the, the, out. Again, the ever always othered white working class, right? Yeah. And so I, my job is to go talk to workers. That's what I do. Um, sometimes I do it close to where I live. Sometimes I get in the car and go somewhere else. Um, and so after Trump won, I said, well, I'm going to go to Indiana and I'm going to go to this carrier plant, which is a place um, right outside of Indianapolis. There's a carrier, it was a furnace factory, there was a Rexnord ball bearings factory around the corner, there was a Sumco, I forget what they made at Sumco, oh my goodness. The Sumco guys went out on strike as these two other factories were um, closing, like mm -hmm. as I got there, and I was like, I love this union. <laughs> Steelworkers Local 1999, they don't care. Um, and this was maybe famously like Donald Trump sort of got on Twitter and attacked the president of this union, Chuck yeah. Jones, for, you know, something, something, he should make more concessions and then we wouldn't lose these jobs at Carrier. So I went to go hang out with the workers at Carrier. And I talked to people who did, right, who were those guys mm. who, and they were mostly guys and they were mostly white, which is not actually the makeup of the factory. Mm -hmm. When you look at the pictures of Trump going into that factory, he is posing with young black women mm. because that's actually a bunch of who worked in those factories. So yes, there are there were like some faction of white guys. The union endorsed Bernie Sanders in the primary, and then was neutral in the general, um, because you know the name Clinton means NAFTA mm. in Indiana. That's absolutely true. That said, most people who voted for Donald Trump would vote for a three-legged dog if it had an R next to its name. <laughs> they are not like the the flip was significant in significant places. It's also significant because it should piss us off. Yeah, because these are our people. Yeah. I talked to a guy who was telling me that he went to union training camp in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is where Eugene Debs was from. Eugene Debs, our formerly most successful socialist presidential candidate until Bernie comes mm -hmm. along, right? This guy's telling me about Eugene Debs and how great this is. And he's like, we need a workers party in this country. We don't have it. Nobody cares about our best interests. He voted for Trump. Yeah. What did we do wrong that that guy could see voting for Bernie and voting for Trump as not enough different mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this is one of the things that like and it, the fact that this line did tend to break down around race and gender yeah. the white men in those factories were able to sort of bracket the racism and sexism mm -hmm. there's like a small amount of people who are really motivated mm -hmm. by it right i assume it's probably the same with brexit yeah. there's like some people who really just want to chuck migrants in the sea and those people were never going to win let them have the Brexit party, whatever, right? Let them vote for Donald Trump. We're not going to win that over. But a guy who's telling me about Eugene Debs mm -hmm. is winnable, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That guy is winnable. So what did we not do to get the message across to that guy? Mm -hmm. And I don't blame him for not voting for Hillary Clinton. I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. But I lived in New York. <laughs> uh, so it didn't matter what I did. Um, you know, the Electoral College is a wonderful thing. But Trump figured out how to game it in the right places because... 
you know, he might seem often like he's mm -hmm. losing it. He might be losing it, but he had enough people around him who were smart enough, and Hillary Clinton really was the one who lost yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. election, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to ask you to make predictions about I who do not will make win or who will, you know, I, I think that's... I think that's <laughs> Journalists I mean, should like, not make it's, predictions. It's, yeah, well, I mean, you know, right? it's nothing, for nothing else other than looking like a fool in about <laughs> a month's time. Um, uh, so, so, so look. The, the 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 last thing I want I want maybe to get your insight on is 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 we have these two movements. We have a movement in the UK. We have yeah. a movement in the US, uh, and they're substantially very very similar. Yeah. Uh, but what was striking to me was someone someone said to me the other day. Someone was American yeah. socialist said, "Guys, I am." So, so envious of yeah. the Corbyn movement where yeah. you have like a democratic culture <laughs> where you can disagree and criticize the leadership. Yeah. It's like, wow. <laughs> it's interesting how things look from the outside, yeah. right? Because yeah. this is, it seems yeah. like a much more kind feel, of core yeah. negotiation in practice. Yeah. Uh, how, how, you know, is there, is there something you think that the UK movement can grasp from the US that it's not, it's not grasped? Oh, that's such an interesting question, right? I feel like the last time I was on Navarre, somebody was like, why is the US left more interesting? And I was like, mm, I'm, I'm, I'm here for a reason, right? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in both places that is, again, like very fairly similar, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think some of what's happening that's different here is, is just based in the fact that you have a different party structure. Mm -hmm. We have to do a lot more heavy lifting to change the Democratic Party, largely because it isn't one. <laughs> you know, there's no conference you can go vote mm -hmm. at. You mm -hmm. can't introduce a bill. So like the Democratic culture is just like literally like you can do this. Mm -hmm. This is a possibility that you can do. We couldn't do that at like the Democratic National Convention, sure. put forward a radical Green New Deal motion that says decarbonize by 2030. And we couldn't do it because it doesn't like matter. And even if it was put forward at the conference, it would have no reflection mm -hmm. in anything that anybody did anyway. So I think in that space, one of the things that's interesting is, is you know, we have this sort of community organizing culture. I'm going to, you know, throw back to my actual story, but mm -hmm. this, this long history of mostly kind of depoliticized, but community organizing, mm. the sort of Alinskyite tradition, yeah. of like being on the ground in the community. And that kind of practical skill um, still has a lot of value. Mm -hmm. And there's people here at this conference who like are, you know, come from that tradition who are here speaking at TWT. Um, and the interesting thing here, right, is that Labour looked at that kind of model and said, we're going to put it in the party. Mm, mm. So instead of being like very depoliticized, it's always inherently politicized, mm -hmm. right? You've got a guy knocking on the door to say, hey, can we help you against your landlord who's screwing you over? And he works for the Labour Party. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know that he works yeah, for the Labour Party. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that might be the first contact you ever had with somebody from the Labour Party, and they're not an asshole. They're trying to help you out, right? And that's a totally different way to, to put this thing that didn't exist yeah, here so yeah, much yeah. to use. And yeah. so I think that like that's one of the things that is good and it is actually like labor is working on yeah, stealing yeah, that, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, great. Yeah. Not enough people know <laughs> that labor is working on <laughs> yes, stealing yeah, that. It's true, it's true. It hasn't really sprung up fully yet, but, yeah. but it will come. It Me will come. Media strategy, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's uh, a thing. <laughs> anyway, Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. This has been uh, great. And the, the transatlantic red wave is coming and we will be a part of it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.